Hi, Kelly Hall here, coming to you live and local and loud from my art gallery here in New Zealand. Um, crack a day today. Uh, so I had a video that I programmed and it went on in the morning. I got a few complaints that I'd put up my metrics. Some people like seeing metrics of a channel, just the growth, but so I've edited that out. Like two people asked me not to ever do that. One lady was real rude and put buy now. So um, I just, uh, I've taken it off. I edited off the first 10 minutes of the video because I want to create a good channel, right? So I'm listening. Um, Karen here down in Australia has just done a super thing. So I was just put, uh, see, look, uh, YouTube has said, you know, they give these options of automatic replies. Welcome, no problem. And it says, for what? But uh, that's interesting. Thanks. Uh, so Karen in Australia. So Australia is probably, reply, Australia is probably um, from Dunedin. It would be three hours flight from here. Um, you're very welcome. I'm talking. <laughs> I'm talking about you in my next video. Reply. Isn't that funny? Because you're going to see it in the future when I've already done this. Anyway. Uh, so really nice comments. Pretty great. Somebody's arguing with me there about Jeff Lacos. Jeff's a bad lad. I don't care what you really say about him. He's not a good guy at all. They just He's subpoenaed to testify in the trial, so he has to behave himself and tell... You're never really going to get the truth right. You're going to get as close as possible as the state, as Georgia can get to it. And today's video is about Georgia Kapperman. Wow. I'm going to be, I think I said it in one of my other videos. I don't know if anyone has said it yet. Georgia for president. I think she could be the first woman president of the United States. It's my opinion. I think she's amazing. Let's look at some of her content. So this is in the recent trial of Charlie Adelson. He got life plus 60 years. <laughs> so this is Georgia Kapperman just proving that um, Charlie was one of the masterminds and really grilling uh, Wendy here on the bump where they did an FBI sting and Donna calls Charlie. When the bump happened, are you familiar with the event I'm referencing as the bump? I am now. When law enforcement approached your mother on the street and handed her a piece of paper? Yes. Okay. When that occurred, who did your mother call? I don't know. Not you, right? Not me. Okay. And once your brother found out about the bump, did he call you about it? No. Who did he call? I don't know. Well, you listened to the calls to authenticate the voices, didn't you? Just just to hear the voices, not to hear the content of the calls. Okay. And the voices were your brother's voice, right? But I, I listened to the calls just to hear who was on them, so I don't know what content they're referencing. I heard your answer. My question to you now is your brother's voice was on the calls. He was on some of the calls I listened to. Okay. Your mother's voice was on the calls. She was on some of the calls I listened to. Did you have any secret meetings with your brother post bump that happened in South Florida? No. <laughs> Did you have any secret meetings post bump in South Florida? No. <laughs> <laughs> which leaves it open to say well you must have had some secret meetings then <laughs> interesting right you were asked about Jeffrey Lacoste and the way that your relationship ended what is OkCupid okay OkCupid okay is a dating website were you on that dating website I was were you on that dating website at the time that you were dating Mr. Lacoste no, I wasn't. And were you speaking? So I guess if you weren't on it, you weren't speaking to multiple men from the website during the time you were dating Mr. O'Class. And I'll remind you that you provided your phone in this case, and it was celebrated, downloaded. Argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's amazing she did that. And uh, I, Wendy's looking pretty angry here. <laughs> 
I will I'll warn you that your phone was cell is it cell bright righted or cell I think it must be cell phone righted like completely copied. So obviously they're saving all of that for a future trial, right? They have all that data. Didn't bring any of that data into this trial into Charlie. So obviously that's a holdback, right? So we're about to watch Georgia Kappelman. This is the retrial of Katie Magbanua. Um This is di called direct direct examination of Lewis Rivera, and this is probably a an, a good way to see somebody being as truthful as possible in a trial. I don't know if it's possible to be 100% truthful in a trial, but um, this is very, very important. So they've just brought the jury in. So this is May the 19th last year. Just to hear... Georgia Keppelman on direct. Mr. Rivera, if you could step up to the witness stand, please. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in, okay? Please raise your right hand, face the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please have a seat. So just to explain what happened with him, back in 2016, he pleaded guilty and took a, took a plea deal with the state, right? Um, Georgia wasn't happy about the plea deal at all. Like she, she wanted him in life, but he was able to testify against Katie and Sigfredo Garcia, Garcia, which was great, right? But so he he is going to get out of jail, right? It's a good plea deal for him. Um, so he will ultimately walk. And Katie could have got the same thing. She they were going to lead her out of jail the same day twice, but she. Uh, Katie just couldn't stop lying. Anyway, here's Georgia on direct. What is your name, sir? Louis Rivera. Do you go by any other names? Tato. Is that T A T O? Yes, Tato? Where are you from? Miami. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes. How many? Ten. Are you currently incarcerated? <laughs> yes, ma'am. In federal prison? Yes, ma'am. So, I don't want to bang you over the head with uh, what I'm trying to do here, but just let me explain that I want to show you when somebody's being honest, they answer the question with an answer. Yes or no. And he's being very polite because he wants out of jail, right? So, <laughs> so you've got this convicted, like, and he just said 10. That's the answer. Yes. There's the answers. There's no trying to re... You know, he's not trying to um, mess around with her or lie. And if he is lying, he's very clever about it. And are you currently serving a sentence associated with the murder case that we're here about today? Yes, ma'am. And you're also serving a federal sentence for a RICO case unrelated to the murder? Yes, ma'am. What was your plea in reference to this murder case? 19 years. 19 years. And what did you have to do in exchange for the 19 years as Cooperate. Opposed? Cooperate. What does that mean to you? Um, say nothing but the truth. Hold on one second. Could the witness perhaps sit forward so we can hear him and also see him at the defense counsel table? All right. We might need to adjust his chair a little bit so we can have these up. All right. Okay. Thank you. Can you see? Yes. You may proceed. All right, cooperate. What does it mean to you? Uh, tell. Tell what you did? Yeah, snitch, I guess. Tell the truth. Snitch, okay. And has anybody told you what to say? No, ma'am. Have I told you what to say? No, ma'am. Am I giving you some kind of code signals of what to say? Not at all, ma'am. Has anybody ever done that for nope. you? Your lawyer? No, ma'am. Law enforcement? Nope. All right. Your understanding of your deal was it was contingent upon you telling what happened in association with your role in this murder. Yes, ma'am. All right. So you've got that going, that sentence. You've got the federal prison sentence going. And you also have pending a BOP case out of Miami. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And that's a up to 15-year penalty on that case, right? Yes, ma'am. Hold on a second. Objection? Objection, Your Honor, just for the use of uh, the initials BOP. Uh, we would ask that it be explained where it is. Okay, overruled. Be handled on cross, Judge. And so that case, um, 
have you been promised anything in reference to that case? No, ma'am. All right, so that's just still out there. Yes, ma'am. All right, have you been promised any reduction or special treatment on your federal case in exchange for your cooperation in this no, murder? Nope. Okay. And you've written some letters asking for reductions in sentence and that kind of thing. Have you been promised anything other than the 19 years in exchange for your cooperation? No, ma'am. Were you already serving the federal sentence when the cops first came to you to ask you about this case? Yes, ma'am. Is the facility that you're currently serving your sentence in, that's federal, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and at some point you'll leave the federal facility and go to a state facility to serve the remainder of your sentence? Yes, ma'am. All right, what are the conditions like in the federal facility that you're at right now? What kind of conditions you're talking about? I mean, is it like a resort? Is it a nice place to live? Not at all. It's pretty. Why not? The same thing as regular prison. There's nothing sweet about feds or state. They're all the same. All the same, meaning not great. Not great at all. Okay. All right. This murder occurred back in July of 2014. I just want to sort of lay out the timeline a little bit with you. Do you know when you were arrested in the federal case? Uh, 2015. All right. Does May of 15 sound right? Yeah. And when were you sentenced on the federal case? If you know. Twelve and a half years. I know, but on what date did you enter the plea? I don't remember. Can't remember that. Okay. But you were definitely serving that sentence when law enforcement came to you to talk to you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Would you agree that it took about two years for them to make this case against you? Oh, yes, ma'am. All right. And was Mr. Garcia arrested around the same time that you were for the murder case that we're here about today? I think he got arrested before me. Okay. Was it like years before you or like months. days? Months? About like a month or two, something like that. Okay. As part of your cooperation in this case, did you give a proffer? That's where you talk to law enforcement. Yes. All right. And did you tell law enforcement everything that you knew about the case? Yes, ma'am. All right. And you've also been subject to some depositions on the case where you Excuse talk me? depositions are where you talk and answer the questions of the lawyers that represent Mr. Garcia and Ms. McVanwa. Have you yes, done that as well? Yes, ma'am. All right. And I know a lot of time has passed between the time that you gave those statements and today. Has your memory gotten better or worse or about the same from back then to now? It's been like eight years. Certain things I'm going to remember, certain things I'm not going to remember. Okay. And if you'll just let us know, it's okay if you don't remember something. Just be sure to be clear about which things you're, you don't remember, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. Before you were taken into custody on the federal case, did you have employment, like legitimate employment? Yes, ma'am, I did. What was that employment? I worked construction in an uh, masonry company. Was it always years. for the same masonry company, or did you bounce around? No, I worked there for 15 years straight. What was the name of the company? Coastal Masonry. And what were your duties there? I was a labor foreman. I ran a little crew. I was like a boss, run the crew and operate machines, make mud and scaffold and stuff like that. All right, so you were participating in construction, building? Yeah. Brick building. laying? Yes, laying block. I want to ask you about your membership in the gang, the Latin Kings. Are you a member or were you a member of the Latin Kings? I was. All right, and you're not now? No, ma'am. Why is that? Because of the cooperation I'm doing today, All right, right so now, at this moment. It's a violation of the agreement, uh, basically the code of the Latin Kings, to give testimony to help the state at all. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And has anything about your cooperation in this case altered your position in prison amongst the other inmates? Yes, I go through a lot. What is the situation in prison based on the fact that you're cooperating in this case? People trying to hurt me. 
Have people tried to kill you? Yes, ma'am. All right. This murder that we're here in court about today, did it have anything to do with your membership in the Latin Kings? No, ma'am, not at all. All right, but the Latin Kings don't care about that. They don't care about that. If you snitch, you're in trouble with them. The rule is the rule. Were you hired to participate in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Were you paid to participate in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Who hired you? Uh, Sigfredo. And who hired Sigfredo? His wife, Katie. Who paid you to participate in the murder of Dan Markell? Uh, Sigfredo. All right. And who gave him the money? His wife, Katie. Do you, did you ever even know Dan Markell? Not at all. Never seen him in your life? Never, ever. Had you ever come to Tallahassee before you came here for this case? No, ma'am. Do you have anything against Dan Markell? Not at all. So your motive in this murder was completely financial? Yes, ma'am. Who was the first person who ever asked you to be involved in this, this murder? Sigredo. Sigredo Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Who set up this? this arrangement, this conspiracy to murder? My understanding that I know was Katie was involved. She was a mastermind. She was in the middle of it. She told so him she, to come do, do a job and he came and told me. Did you have any understanding of why we were coming to Tallahassee to kill this guy? Not at that moment. Okay. But you knew it was a murder for hire? Yes, ma'am. And you knew someone above Katie was, the money was coming from somewhere above Katie. Yes, ma'am. So, um, Dan's parents are actually at this trial. They're, they're behind Georgia Kappelman watching this, watching him being, uh, to me, it just seems so honest. Like, it's exactly what happened, right? From what we know. Um, so, Wendy gets implicated here. How did you know Sigfredo Garcia? Childhood friends, we grew up together. All right, what about Catherine Magbanwa? I met him through, through him. You met her through him? Yes, ma'am. And what was their relationship? They were husband and wife, they had kids together. All right, and how long had Sigfredo Garcia been with Catherine Magbanwa? For like 10 years probably, something like that. All right, so a long time. And he was your best friend? Yes, ma'am. You referred to him as your brother? Yes, ma'am. And did you all hang out on a regular basis? Every day. Including often Catherine Magbanoa when they were together? Yes, ma'am. All right, so you've been around her many, many times in your life. Yeah, he worked with me. And did you, he worked with you at Coastal Masonry? Yes, ma'am. All right, and did you and your child's mother, Jessica, hang out with Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine Magdano as, as couples? I mean, once in a while, and I like that, but once in a while. All right, were Jessica and Catherine Magdano friendly? It was all right, they were friends. Okay, at least at one time they were friendly? Yeah. Who was paid, to your knowledge, who all was paid to participate in this murder? It was all paid, it was me, Sigfredo, Katie got paid. Who is the dentist? I don't know him. I call him the dentist, but his name is Charlie, I guess. But, but at the time of this murder, you just knew there was a dentist? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. And who was the, who did you think the dentist was? It was her boyfriend, Katie's boyfriend. All right, and did you ever know Sigfredo Garcia to be in contact with the dentist? Not that I know. Did he have phone calls with the dentist? No. Text message with the dentist, to your knowledge? No, ma'am. You ever see him talking with the dentist? No, ma'am. All right, and you didn't know the dentist? No, ma'am, not at all. Never personally met him? Never. How did you know that the dentist was dating Catherine McBanwa? Uh, Sigfredo told me one day, and I had seen, I had seen him with Sigfredo. We're not really seen him like that, but we pulled up in a restaurant where they were eating. And he told me about the relationship that they had together. 
To your knowledge, did Charlie Adelson have any affiliation with the Latin Kings? No. Did he have any friends or contacts in the Latin Kings that you knew of? Not that I know of, but no. See the looks on his face? Um, you can see how his muscles, like, he reacted so well. Like, to me, this is just really good testimony. Seems honest. When she said, does he have any affiliation to the Latin kids? He went, no. Really good, in my opinion. And you were the boss of the Latin Kings in that area, right? Yes, ma'am. So Sigrida Garcia knew who the dentist was. So in my opinion, he's doing the right thing. He doesn't have much of a choice, but well, he does have a choice. Like Katie won't do it. Like she's gonna, but he gets out. Anyway. I mean, he knew that they were dating. Okay. But he it, knew that his, well, we're saying wife, but were they legally married? Do you know? Who was married? Garcia and Magdana. Oh, I don't know if they were legally married, but he always called it his wife, just like I call Jessica my wife, but we're not married, you know. All right, so I'll refer to her as his wife. Did Sigfredo Garcia know that his wife was seeing a dentist? Yes, ma'am. Did he know the name of the dentist? To your knowledge. No, that in my knowledge, no one. So that's interesting. So maybe they're not even married. Are they not even married, Meg Benoit? And is it just a saying? I didn't know that. Did you know that? Let me know in the comments. He just said they probably aren't married. All right. So did Sigfredo Garcia, when you were enlisted to come to Tallahassee to commit this murder, did he indicate to you that the dentist was behind this or that the dentist family was behind this? Anything to that effect? No. Okay. What about this something to do with a lady and her kids? Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, all I knew that she was giving us the money. All I knew that the lady and the kids was giving us the money. Other the lady, because I never knew her name. But that lady turned out to be Wendy Adelson, right? Yes, ma'am. And your understanding of this murder was that ultimately what? I'm surprised the defense didn't jump there because she's testifying for him. So I'm surprised the defense didn't jump up and object, but I'll just play it again. This is very, very important. You know, as, as couples. I mean, once in a while, and I like that, but once in a while. All right, were Jessica and Catherine McBanawa friendly? It was all right, they were friends. Okay. At least at one time they were friendly? Yeah. And I had seen, I had seen them with Sigredo, but not really seen them like that, but we pulled up in a restaurant where they were eating, and he told me about the relationship that they had together. To your knowledge, did Charlie Adelson have any affiliation with the Latin Kings? No. Did he have any friends or contacts in the Latin Kings that you knew of? Not that I know of, but no. And you were the boss of the Latin Kings in that area, right? Yes, ma'am. So Sigfrida Garcia knew who the dentist was? I mean, he knew that they were dating. Okay. But he it... knew that his, well, we're saying wife, but were they legally married? Do you know? Who was married? Garcia and Magdana. Oh, I don't know if they were legally married, but he always called it his wife, just like I call Jessica my wife, but we're not married, you know. All right, so I'll refer to her as his wife. Did Sigfredo Garcia know that his wife was seeing a dentist? Yes, ma'am. Did he know the name of the dentist, to no. your knowledge? No, that in my knowledge, no, I don't. All right, so did Sigfredo Garcia, when you were enlisted to come to Tallahassee to commit this murder, did he indicate to you that the dentist was behind this or that the dentist family was behind this? Anything to that effect? No. Okay. What about this something to do with a lady and her kids? Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, all I knew that she was giving us the money. I called her the lady because I never knew her name. But that lady turned out to be Wendy Adelson, right? Yes, ma'am. And your understanding of this murder was that ultimately what? That she was going to pay. 
that the money was coming through from her or yes. and that this murder was to help her in some way. Yes, ma'am. Help her how? To get her kids back. And did you ever know Garcia to have any contact with Wendy Adelson? No, not to my knowledge. So it did seem a little rehearsed, but it seems pretty honest, right? Makes sense. Wendy's paying the Latin Kings to M U R D E R her husband just to get the kids back so they don't have to do all this. And my last video features Wendy's first lawyer, um, Atkinson or whatever her name is. Um, she first lodged the divorce filings or the the things for the children back in 2012, October 2012. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's a long road. So yeah. So Wendy, Charlie and his parents were splitting it three ways. So I think it was meant to be it was probably meant to be maybe 50 grand each. This is where Jeff Lacoste, and no one's put this together because they keep talking about 15 or 50,000. 50 would have come from Wendy, 50 from Charlie, and um, 50 from the parents, right? From Donna and Harvey. But I think Charlie, <laughs> I think he double, I think he ripped off his parents. I think he told them it was more and they gave him. And then I, yeah, I don't know. I think, they, I think, in my opinion, IMO, this is just for entertainment purposes. I think that Wendy and Charlie got the parents to pay more than they even intended to. And Wendy probably didn't end up putting any money in. Charlie might have, but I'd say they took all of it from the parents, kept some for themselves, and, and paid these guys some. That's what I think, maybe. It's just a speculation. So all the contact with any Adelson or Dennis person happened through Catherine McDaniel. Yes, ma'am. Objection, leaving. Overruled. Gosh, what a defense. Did Sigfredo Garcia have a beef with the dentist? I mean, he didn't like him. They were together. He didn't like him because he was dating his wife? Yeah. How much were you paid for your part in this murder? They gave me 37000 a lot of money right 37,000 and they still couldn't get it right it's almost like they over invested because I know Dahlia Diffolito didn't get away with it but she was only doing it for like 5,000 um in Wendy's podcast she says it was a professional but there's just so many mistakes, like hiring cars. Like I, I don't think a professional would hire a car. I think they would steal one, right? You wouldn't hire a car if you were a pro. I don't think so. But anyway, I, I just thought it was interesting to see her talking to him and then him outing Wendy uh, in the trial. Interesting, right? So let's um he might even get better conditions i'd say he'll come when wendy goes to trial um i would say he'll come and testify again be interesting to see what happens um more on georgia asking me to relay this to you saying please thank georgia for doing such a stellar job all the while in some stunning pumps, yellow tipped with animal print, you go girl. So you have not only legal fans, but fashionista fans as well. Um, now, people want to know, 
they're watching you and they're saying that they're they're mystified by your poise and patience and uh, they want to know how you stay so cool under pressure how do you stay so cool in justice how does that motivate you in your preparation I would say exacting justice is the sole motivator. We don't get paid a lot of money. We don't usually, as I said, get a lot of love or thanks for the work that we do here, but it is extremely motivating to feel confident that I'm doing the right thing and doing, you know, a small part to leave the world a little better than how I found it. So I think my process is, you know, relying heavily on my team. I've got law enforcement behind me, helping me investigate and prepare the best case possible. In this particular case, I had a second chair, a third chair, and some additional folks working on some legal research issues. So it was really nice to have that kind of support in place. So that probably helps too. They do allow it in every case. In Florida, we have very broad public records laws, all the government takes place, what we call in the sunshine. So it sort of comports with that, that all the court proceedings are open to the public. Um, it does not become much of a circus though, because typically a pool cam operator is designated to run a feed to all the other outlets. So it's not like the courtroom's packed with um, media yeah. folks. There's just one pool camera and one uh, photographer that supplies the the footage it, to it everybody makes, else. It makes me feel better. Why did it take four years for the first um, indictment? The first indictment came at the conclusion of a long investigation that just took a very long time. Um, so one example would be getting the tower dump if you're I know you guys are familiar with the case, but the law enforcement knew that the suspects had followed the victim into the gym. So we knew they probably had cell phones there. So let's get all the cell phones that are communicating with the cell tower at the gym and come through them and see if anything sticks out. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that just takes forever. Trying to find a Prius in Miami takes forever. So a lot of the investigation just sort of was like needles in haystacks and it took a long time to get through and how oh it's my microsoft sorry this is just um georgia about to explain why there's no dea th penalty in this case Yes, I think the primary reason is that we were not successful in obtaining the death penalty against the shooter, so did not feel that we would have a viable chance of pursuing the death penalty against the hire. Um. So isn't that interesting? So because the shooter, I think they should have gone after it in every case, right? Because... You don't know what the next jury is going to be thinking or agreeing with and how strong, because your, your cases are only going to get stronger and stronger as you go on, right? Which is why it was clever for Lewis to take a plea deal. Um, yeah, really interesting. All right, let's look at something else. So this is the 28th of September, 2019. This is the opening statement. This is where it all began. Um, in the very first trial of Sigfredo Garcia and Katie McBenoa before Katie's retrial. So this is where it all began, and this is where Georgia first come into the highlight. So that at 11 a.m. on July 18th, 20... The evidence in this case will show that at 11 a.m. on July 18th, 2014, Jim Geiger is with his wife and grandchildren at his home on Trescott Drive when he hears a noise that sounds like a gunshot. He goes to a large bay window at the front of his residence and looks outside toward his neighbor's house. And he observes what appears to be a light-colored Prius or Prius-type vehicle back quickly out of his neighbor's driveway and take off toward Benton Road. Concerned, Mr. Geiger walks out his front door 
and walks in the direction of his neighbor's residence. His neighbor is Dan Markell. Seeing that Mr. Markell's vehicle is running in the garage, he's thinking, well, maybe Mr. Markell's about to back out. So he kind of goes back to his house, but he kind of keeps an eye on the driveway. Um, when Mr. Markell does not back out after a couple moments, Mr. Geiger goes over to do some further investigation. And that is when he sees a terrible sight. His neighbor, Dan Markell, behind the wheel with a terrible wound to his head. There is shattered glass everywhere. Uh, Mr. Markell is seated in the driver's seat. He's alive, he's moving, he's still groaning, but he's not able to talk, he's not responsive, and he's obviously in distress. Mr. Geiger, seeing this, runs home for his phone and calls 911. That call came in at 11.01 a.m. in broad daylight. First responders arrive to find 41-year-old Dan Markell unresponsive. He's taken to the hospital where he survives for some time, I think about 14 hours before he is officially pronounced deceased. Dan Markell, father of two young boys and highly respected attorney at law and professor at the Florida State University College of Law, was shot twice in the head in his own garage in broad daylight. Who would do such a thing? Nothing seems to be missing from the crime scene. There's no sign of a forced entry or a robbery attempt. How do you begin to investigate a case like this? What clues did the killers leave behind? Well, thanks to our 911 caller, we know that the suspect vehicle is a light-colored Prius. And there's a second 911 call as well. You'll learn that Mr. Markell was on the phone at the time he was murdered, and the person that he was on the phone with heard Markell say, hold on a moment, there's someone in my driveway I don't recognize. Then the line went dead and the man was unable to reach Mr. Markell again, so he called 911. So we learn from that that the person that murdered Mr. Markell was a stranger to him. It was someone he did not recognize. An inquiry into Dan Markell's movements that morning revealed that he dropped his two young sons off at daycare at about 8.50 a.m then went to work out at Premier Gym, and then was killed shortly upon his return home from the gym. Law enforcement obtained surveillance from the gym and later surveillance from a city bus, so there are cameras mounted to city buses, and they got surveillance from the city buses along the route that they think this Prius might have traveled, along the route that they think Mr. Markell would have traveled between uh, the gym and his residence and they discover something ominous on this surveillance footage. A light-colored Prius, which they deduced from this uh, surveillance was silver pine mica, that's the ex exact color, uh, which appears to follow Dan Markell into the gym parking lot at 9.11 a.m. on the morning of his death. The Prius waits in the parking lot for Mr. Markell to work out, which is approximately an hour, and then the Prius follows Mr. Markell out of the parking lot at about 10.38 a.m. The Prius was also observed on a surveillance camera um, from the city bus, which narrows the time of Mr. Markell's death even further because we see that Prius on a bus both before, minutes before, and then moments after the murder as well, fleeing at a high rate of speed north on Thomasville Road towards the interstate. And you will observe these surveillance videos and le learn a few things from these images that were captured about our suspect vehicle. You'll learn the exact color of the Prius, silver pine mica, the approximate year of the vehicle, um, the fact that the vehicle had a black aftermarket side mirror attached to it, a missing tow hook, hook cover, which is this little round circle on the front bumper of the vehicle, and a SunPass transponder mounted to the front of the windshield. Also, in one of the images from the city bus captured after the murder, you will see the presence of what appears to be a driver in a dark colored shirt and a passenger in a light colored shirt. That becomes important because later when we have two suspects develop, we find an ATM video that shows in Pembroke Pines, Florida on the same day of the murder, a silver pine mica Prius at an ATM with our two suspects pictured inside, and you'll see those images as well. So meanwhile, law enforcement's gathering these surveillance images, 
trying to get information about the suspects and the vehicle that might be involved in this murder. Um, while they're doing that, they're simultaneously trying to learn more about uh, Dan Markell's life, who is close to him, who might have a motive to want him dead. Law enforcement meets with Markell's ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, whereby they learn that she has been embroiled in a very contentious divorce and continued litigation with Mr. Markell regarding uh, the enforcement of the divorce settlement agreement and specifically the custody of their two boys. Pleadings from the divorce indicate that Wendy Adelson had made efforts to relocate to South Florida. She'd actually moved to South Florida with the kids and a court ordered her on June 20th, 2013 that she had to come back to Tallahassee. She couldn't leave with Mr. Markell's children. Emails between Wendy Adelson and her mother, Donna Adelson, that occur around the time of this litigation, about one year before the murder, indicate that Donna Adelson despised Dan Markell and was desperate to find a way for Wendy and these two kids to move down to where she was located in South Florida. Uh, Donna Adelson in these emails refers to Dan Markell as a religious zealot, a bastard. She says, let's show this F blank, 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 what will make him absolutely miserable, and proposes a plan of action for how to threaten and or bully and or bribe Dan Markell into allowing Wendy to move to South Florida with the children. These plans included converting the children to Catholicism, even though the entire family was Jewish, all the, all the Adelsons were Jewish as well. But this suggestion was a way to gain leverage against Mr. Markell because Dan Markell was very observant in his faith. And it was very important to him that his children be raised in an environment that observed and was committed to the Jewish faith. The divorce between Wendy and Dan Markell had, was final back on July 31st of 2013, but as I mentioned, the litigation continued as both sides, both sides filed pleadings back and forth in reference, reference to alleged violations of the divorce agreement, in reference to child custody, and specifically one of the last pleadings filed prior to Dan Markell's murder is in reference to Wendy Adelson's mother, his mother-in-law, Donna Adelson. And in this pleading, he alleged that the children's grandmother, Donna Adelson, was disparaging him to the kids. And he was petitioning the court to order that Donna Adelson not be allowed to have unsupervised contact with his children, her grandchildren. A ruling was never made on that motion because Dan Markell was murdered before the hearing was conducted. Wendy Adelson was interviewed, as I mentioned, and she will tell you that she sure hopes someone didn't do this on her behalf. She will tell you that her brother, Charlie Adelson, who also lives in South Florida with her mother, not with, but in the same area as her mother, Donna Adelson, and her father, Harvey Adelson, she'll tell you that Charlie, quote, looked into hiring a hitman, but decided buying her a TV as a divorce present would be cheaper. And what was her alibi? For the murder? Where was she when Dan Markell was killed? She has a witness who was present at her home, a repairman who was fixing that very TV. An appointment that was set up by her mother, Donna Adelson. So Wendy's brother, Charlie Adelson, has made references to hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell and now hitmen have murdered Dan Markell. Meanwhile, law enforcement is still putting together more information about the Prius and the killers. They have gotten a search warrant for all the phone numbers that interacted with the cell tower consistent with people being in the area of Premier Gym at the time that we know they were there. So literally every cell phone that interacted with those towers during that hour period of time. And they cross-referenced all of that data with Mr. Markell and, and his in-laws. So basically, have any of the phone numbers that appear on that tower around the time that we know the suspects were at the gym been in contact recently with Dan Markell or with his in-laws or with his ex-wife? 
The purpose of that was to try to um, see if there was any link there. And coming through all this data and putting it all together was a very tedious task, but they did find one number with a South Florida exchange, which was present both in the area at Premier, of Premier Jim at the time that the killers were there, and was linked to a single phone call on July 1st, 2014, so about 17 days before the murder, this number that was at Premier Jim from South Florida contacted Harvey Adelson, so the father-in-law of the deceased, husband of Donna Adelson, father of Wendy Adelson. And that number that contacted Harvey Adelson and that was also present at the gym on our date in question belonged to Sigfredo Garcia, the defendant in this case, a.k.a. Tuto, T-U-T-O. And an examination of Garcia's call logs showed a frequent contact with another number, which also was present on our, what we're calling, tower dump. So all those numbers that interacted with that cell phone tower at Premier at that time. Another number, no connection with the Adelsons that we found, but a frequent caller of Sigfredo Garcia is Luis Rivera. That phone number was also present at Premier at the time that our, our suspect vehicle was there. Luis Rivera's AKA is Tato. So we've got Tuto and Tato. So why would these two guys, Tuto and Tato, with no apparent ties to Tallahassee, be all the way up here from Miami, hanging around the gym at the same time that our suspect Prius was there? Possibly because they're our suspects. They're the ones inside the Prius. So now that we have these suspect phone numbers, we subpoena all the location information from the cell phone providers to show information about Rivera and Garcia's phones. Where were they during the time leading up to the homicide and after the homicide and at the time of the homicide? And what it shows, which you'll get detailed testimony about in the form of digital evidence, is that Rivera and Garcia's phones leave Miami on July 16th, 2014. You'll see their movements up from Miami to Tallahassee. You'll see their movements around Tallahassee, including being in the area of Premier Gym. And then you'll see that both phones are consistent with having been turned off around the time that the Prius was at Premier Gym waiting for Dan Markell to come out. And both phones remain inactive until about an hour after the murder, where they pop back up, headed southbound on the interstate toward Miami. As a result of this evidence, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia were charged with first degree murder of Dan Markell. The police work that has just taken me a few minutes to summarize took about two years to accomplish. By the time Rivera and Garcia were arrested for this murder, Rivera was in custody on an unrelated federal racketeering charge, which concerned Rivera's affiliation with a criminal street gang. So when we develop these suspects, Rivera's in custody on something else. Ultimately, the state made a deal with Rivera to tell the truth in exchange for a plea to second degree murder and a 19 year prison sentence to run concurrent or at the same time as his federal sentence. Rivera will tell you that he was hired by his lifelong friend, Sigfredo Garcia, who was hired by his longtime girlfriend and children's mother, Catherine Magbanawa, AKA Katie, to come to Tallahassee and to kill Dan Markell. Magbanawa had an on again, off again relationship with Mr. Garcia. And during one of the off again periods, you will learn prior to the murder, during one of these off again periods with Mr. Garcia, she was seeing somebody else, a wealthy dentist by the name of Charlie Adelson. Charlie Adelson had a sister in Tallahassee, Wendy Adelson. And Wendy Adelson had a problem. And her problem was named Dan Markell. And the solution to that problem was Magbanoa, Rivera, and Garcia. Garcia told Rivera that 
Catherine Magbanova had gotten them a job, and it was a big one. It was going to pay a lot of money. The job was in Tallahassee. Rivera and Garcia made, you'll learn, not one, but two trips to Tallahassee. The first trip was about six weeks prior to Markel's death, and it was intended to be a murder trip, but it ended up being more of a scouting trip. The murder did not occur. Garcia told Rivera on the way to Tallahassee on that first trip that they were coming up here to do a murder. Garcia showed Mr. Rivera a photograph of who they were coming to kill. He had a piece of paper with a picture of Dan Markell on it and some tight words underneath. He indicated to Rivera that they needed to kill this guy so that his wife could get their kids and that they were going to be paid $100,000 for the job with Rivera's cut being $35,000. Rivera bought a gun off the street and Garcia rented a car for this June trip. Rivera asked Garcia, and this is the first trip, Rivera asked Garcia who knew that he was going along, who, who knew he was involved. And Garcia assured him that only Katie knew, Catherine Magbanoa. On the way, Garcia showed Rivera the piece of paper, and Rivera also overheard several phone calls between Garcia and Magbanoa during this first trip which included Magbanoa instructing Garcia about what they needed to do, including things like, make sure you do everything right. Don't do anything stupid. When you are done, call me. Garcia and Rivera got a hotel room here in Tallahassee on this first trip. They did some scouting around the Markel residence, but couldn't get the job done, and ultimately headed back to Miami. Six weeks later, the two returned to Tallahassee in the green Prius rented by Luis Rivera in Miami, Florida. They bought, brought the same gun that was present on the first trip, the one that Luis Rivera bought off the street, and that ultimately becomes the murder weapon. On this trip, they spend two nights in Tallahassee, again scouting around the Markell residence, attempting to follow Mr. Markell, and you'll hear um, you know, Katie, Catherine Mabanoa previously instructed them not to do anything stupid. And that will be, her reasoning for that will be evidenced by some of the activity that they get up to when they're here. For example, Garcia accidentally shot a hole in the floorboard on the passenger side of the Prius with the murder weapon prior to the murder, which resulted in them severing the gas line and rendering the vehicle inoperable. Then they had to get a ride to the store to buy some supplies to fix the thing and fix the thing on the side of the road. So you'll hear a little bit about that. Then, the night before the murder, Rivera will tell you that he took a picture of an owl and posted it on Instagram, which, as you all may know, indicates where you are when you post something. And he'll tell you that Catherine Magbanoa immediately called Garcia to tell Rivera how stupid he was and to take the picture down because nobody could know where he was. Again, Rivera overhears conversation during the second trip between Garcia and Magbanoa. Catherine Magbanoa indicates that they have to get they have to get this job done because the professor is planning to leave town in the near future. Um, so on July 18th, 2014, Rivera and Garcia follow Professor Markell to the daycare where he drops off his kids at approximately 8.50 in the morning. Then they go to the gym where they wait in the parking lot while Mr. Markell works out. And then they go to his home where Rivera pulls the Prius into the driveway close up to the bumper of Mr. Markell where he's parked in his driveway. You'll hear that Garcia gets out and approaches Markel with the revolver purchased on the street by Luis Rivera, and that, he sh that Garcia shoots Mr. Markel twice through the driver's window before hopping back into the Prius. Rivera backs out of the driveway, and they head back to Miami. I mentioned earlier that both men had their phones off, and that once they turn their phones back on, the very first call that either of them make after the homicide is Mr. Garcia to Catherine Magbanoa. And what does he say? 
He says, the job is done. And what does she reply? She says, I know. There's a brief discussion about when they'll get their money. And Catherine McBanawa says, don't worry about the money. I will get the money. You'll get it tomorrow. Then the next day, Rivera was at the barber shop when he talked to Catherine McBanawa. She advised that she had the money and was looking for Garcia to pay up, but wasn't able to find Garcia. Rivera knew where to So just wanting to just interject there. They turn the phones on, ring Katie and say the job son. She goes, I know. How does she know? WhatsApp. <laughs> How does she know on WhatsApp? Wendy drove to the scene of the crime and used WhatsApp while she was at the scene. She said she was talking to some guy overseas, which she likely was. <laughs> but so Charlie would need to know that it's done too. So Georgia brings up the trial saying, asking what WhatsApp is. I'll show you again in a minute. So that's how we link Wendy again, not just from Luis Rivera saying that he, she had promised to pay them to get her kids back, but also Katie already knew that the hit was done before the hitman rung her. I know, she says. ...to look for Garcia at another young lady's residence. Rivera successfully rounds up Garcia and they head to... They all meet at Rivera's house where Rivera gets his payment. So Rivera, Garcia, and Magbanoa are all present. Rivera gets his money, $35,000, stapled into packs of $1,000 apiece. Garcia also gave Rivera a little extra money later that night while they're out celebrating. In the weeks and months after the homicide, Rivera and Garcia bought, they each bought a motorcycle, Garcia also bought a car. Catherine Magbanoa also got a car, a black Lexus, whose previous owner happens to be Harvey Adelson. Magbanoa was also put on the payroll at the Adelson's dental practice shortly after the homicide and began receiving regular checks for approximately two years. Although law enforcement has yet to determine what, if anything, she what what if any service she provides to that dental office so some people could say well charlie gave it to her even though it's in the dad's name for the practice but it's your car you have to change that um registration of the car into her name so harvey you know that's coming from this family i call it a rico case <laughs> i know it's not a rico case but it's just that the adelson institute seems to run like a a, a crime family, the four of them, right? Seems to. Office, And the folks that work there don't seem to know either. She got a breast augmentation surgery shortly after the homicide. She had trips paid for by Charlie Adelson after the homicide that didn't even include him. And she deposited large amounts of cash into her bank account around the time of the murder, sometimes multiple deposits at different <coughs> banks in the same day. So in an effort to ferret out who are all of the members of this conspiracy and to prove how information flowed, how was the conspiracy structured, we, uh, on April 19th, 2016, so almost two years after the murder, law enforcement conducts an undercover operation. They got court authorization to go up on a wire, what's called a wire, on Catherine Magbano's phone and also Charlie Adelson's phone, which means they could listen in real time to what was being said on these phones. That's despite some popular belief, not something the government normally can do without special authorization. In this case, that authorization was put in place and law enforcement was prepared to listen to both Catherine Magbanoa's calls and Charlie Adelson's calls. They then sent an un undercover agent posing as someone who basically was on behalf of Rivera to walk up to Donna Adelson on the street and basically try to extort money out of her. This undercover officer handed Donna Adelson a piece of paper. And on the paper is a story about the death of Dan Markell 
It includes a photograph of Dan Markell, and written on the page is a phone number and the amount $5,000. And the undercover agent, I'm summarizing, tells Donna Adelson, basically, my buddy Rivera, he didn't say the word Rivera, but my buddy's sitting in jail, and you're out here taking care of uh, Katie and Tuto. So basically, he's asking for $5,000 for Rivera to even things out. So now law enforcement starts listening to the calls. Like, you know, we do this little thing. It's two years after the murder. We do this uh, undercover operation to try to generate some chatter and see who will say what to whom. And you'll get an opportunity to hear some of those phone calls that result from this undercover operation. That phone number, the undercover agent's phone number that's written on that piece of paper that's handed to Donna, Donna Adelson, you're going to see that it travels from Donna to Charlie to Katie and then to Sigfredo. You will hear and see evidence of these calls, and you can make of them what you will. But in conclusion, I believe that you will be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the state is not pulling a fast one on you, but rather that Catherine Magbanoa was hired to solicit Garcia, who in turn solicited Rivera to come to Tallahassee and to execute Mr. Markell in cold blood. Well, they certainly did, did that. There was two in the jury that um, couldn't convict Katie, so she had a retrial. She lied and she got offered two proffers and she lied in those and she's still sitting in jail. She may have one more chance to put, I think probably between her um, WhatsApp messages with Wendy, maybe to put, she may have one opportunity to get less time uh, when they send uh, Wendy to trial. So please like and subscribe, um, share on social media. If this video gets shared to um, Facebook, then uh, it bumps up my uh, my views. YouTube can see it, or Google can see it being shared, and it helps me to get more views. So I really appreciate that. I hope you enjoyed this and got some value out of it. Yeah, interesting.